I'm Dwayne Brown tonight on KPBS Evening Edition. Imagine seeing a full picture of your health, a San Diego service offering patients a chance to sequence their own DNA. How California's new laws regulating medical marijuana could affect legal dispensaries in San Diego and its impact on getting recreational use measure on the November ballot. I'm Peggy Pico, also coming up. From drones to phones, smart TVs and more, how much will California's new laws protect your privacy? When you don't have anything, someone offers you something, you know, it's hard to say no. Blowing in the wind, a historic wind farm in Mexico powering homes and fueling a debate on both sides of the border. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Border Patrol is reporting a big drop in use of force cases involving its agents. There were 768 incidents in the last fiscal year. That's down 26 percent from the year before. A spokesman for the Border Patrol Union says the drop reflects excessive caution by officers. Our, our agents are not stupid. They, they see what is happening in America and what happens when you defend yourself. He says agents are hesitating to use force in situations that call for it because they fear being vilified. The agency has been criticized for its use of force tied to immigrant deaths and has been making reforms. Gun control advocates are pushing forward with a plan to expand background checks. KPBS reporter Steve Walsh explains they're taking their campaign to Washington despite the gridlock on Capitol Hill. Flanked by members of the Brady campaign, Congressman Scott Peters made a plea to leadership in the House asking them to allow a vote on a bill he is co-sponsoring after the latest school shooting at a community college in Oregon. We're not trying to do something radical. We're trying to improve an existing law that's got a big loophole in it. That We have a background check system that only applies to 60 percent of gun purchases. Let's cover the rest. And let's do what we can to prevent the wrong people from getting these weapons. Since the shooting, Peter said leadership has not allowed any gun control measures to make their way to the House floor. Joining him was former San Diego Mayor and Police Chief Jerry Sanders. Sanders says when he started in law enforcement, it was rare to find a gun on a suspect. By the end of his tenure, police would have enough guns after every weekend to fill a shopping cart. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. They're staying on target. Cities around the county met the state's water conservation goals for the fourth month in a row. New numbers show the county used 26 percent less water last month compared to the same period in 2013. Governor Brown ordered urban water users to cut back consumption by 20 percent because of the ongoing drought. San Diego County Water Authority says all that conservation has allowed the agency to store extra water in our reservoirs. Water conservation targets will be easier to hit if the ocean warming condition known as El Nino brings extra rain. County and emergency officials were briefed today on the strengthening system. El Nino may trigger heavy rainfall, flooding and mud flows across the county starting as early as November. National Weather Service says it's now looking like one of the strongest on record. What we're thinking is once El Nino engages with the atmosphere, once it brings the jet stream down from Oregon and then locks it into Southern California, that that warm water will actually set the stage for even heavier rainfall rates along the coast. The biggest concern among emergency officials is a large amount of rain in a short period of time or several days worth of steady rains causing burned hillsides to slide. The flooding in South Carolina was ab it, absolutely devastating to watch. And I, I think it's a, sort of a wake-up call to people that um, we're not used to seeing a lot of rain widespread in a short amount of time here in San Diego County. And we have to plan for the worst-case scenario. There are plans to alert the public of potential dangers before, during, and after storms. Folks are urged to register their cell phones at ReadySanDiego.org. Slightly cooler temperatures on tap for San Diego ahead of a low pressure system bringing a chance of showers in some areas tomorrow. We're looking at 80s and 70s along the coast over the next few days. The same picture for the inland valleys with a chance of showers and thunder in the forecast. 80s and 70s in the mountains, 
90s and triple digits for the desert. Preserving open space in the East County for neighbors and endangered species. Lakeside Downs, just outside of Santee's conservation boundaries, is the 34th open space acquisition purchased to protect a wildlife habitat previously proposed for a housing development. The 410-acre the site is home to valuable coastal sage scrub, the rare Hermes copper butterfly, and the endangered California gnatcatcher. And that bird is very limited, uh, probably 80, at least 80 percent of its historic habitat is gone, doesn't exist anymore, and what's left is very fragmented. So there are very few core areas that support gnatcatchers and a number of other species that are endemic to, that, to this community, 65 different species. The gnatcatcher is a kitten-like, uh, has a kitten-like meow of a call, is considered a prime indicator of the ecosystem health its population has been threatened by transmission lines. Sand Ag and the Department of Defense contributed $8 million to help preserve and maintain the open space. Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill to ban the sale of e-cigarettes to minors. It now makes it illegal for vendors to sell any type of vaping devices to kids. E-cigarettes and vape pens target a younger audience using sweet-flavored compounds with names like gummy bears and Fruit Loops. They don't have nicotine, but have been shown to contain other harmful chemicals. Nearly 20 years after California became the first to legalize medical marijuana, the state is finally planning on regulating the growing industry. Peggy Pico explains how the new laws will affect San Diego dispensaries. The new medical marijuana laws replace a patchwork of local regulations with statewide laws, which will be overseen by the new Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation. But California voters could pass a recreational use measure in 2016 before some of these new regulations even take effect. Here with a look at how these changes will impact the marijuana industry in our region is attorney Jessica McElfresh, medical marijuana law policy and regulation specialist and member of normal the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws and jessica what do these new medical marijuana laws regu and, and regulation bureau what do they actually cover well they cover virtually every aspect of the medical marijuana industry including cultivation including uh, nurseries for small plants or initial plants transportation testing uh, making products such as edibles or topicals or tinctures, and of course, uh, storefront dispensaries and potentially delivery services. And why is that important? to have those little little pieces all connected together. Well, what's important about it is our current model has not made much room for the production or cultivation side of it. And much of the local regulation has been focused on storefront dispensaries. We're acknowledging that this is an industry where an entire aspect of medical products are made for people and we're regulating it accordingly in a manner more such as Colorado rather than our current model of not having any statewide regulation or well, licensing. San Diego just opened its le first legal medical marijuana dispensary uh, earlier this year. How many dispensaries, legal dispensaries, are there right now in the city and how will the change actually affect the dispensary? At this point in the city, I believe that there are two currently open uh, with conditional use permits from the city of San Diego. I believe that the city has approved approximately 10 more conditional use permits with a couple more to come, uh, how it will affect them is it will not affect them immediately day by day. For the moment, they will continue on in their current fashion. Eventually, these entities will have to uh, receive licenses from the state. We expect the state to begin issuing licenses in 2018. However, uh, they are going to be allowed to continue on during that time. And there's also a provision in this law that uh, any entity permitted by a local government before January 1st, 2018, will likely be permitted to remain open during the licensing process. And that would, have, of course, include these entities here so in San Diego. Is that how local and state regulators are going to work together, or are there other ways? Will there be state inspectors, local inspectors, once these laws uh, go into effect? We don't entirely know if there will be uh, state inspectors, as in someone coming out from the state. There is a great deal of discussion in these bills of 
basically uh, locals being able to enforce various state regulations. What's going to happen immediately is the department will be created and other departments within state government, including the Department of Agriculture, will begin a rulemaking process working out specific regulations starting on January 1st, 2016, when this law goes into effect. Okay. Now, many of the uh, voters, uh, I should say, there are, I've heard from a few that are anticipating a 2016 ballot measure for recreational marijuana use. How do you think these new laws will influence that effort? And were they kind of made anticipating possibly a ballot measure? I believe that there was some intention by the legislature to create a statewide system that the recreational could uh, graft onto or expand upon. And I do believe that in the most recent, uh, some of the most recent drafts of the statewide ballot initiatives for recreational marijuana that I've read, that is acknowledged and drawn upon. However, I do believe that there is an intent to focus on medical marijuana by the state legislature and that this bill was a long time coming and that we didn't have a state system. So that's talking about the city and the state, but federal laws still prohibit marijuana use. Uh, will these new state laws kind of help keep federal regulators or enforcement away? We like to hope so. Uh, the most recent memo during the Obama administration, the coal memo, the most recent coal memo, I should say, uh, basically directs various uh, federal prosecutors that it's not a great use of their resources to go after medical marijuana entities that are operating in compliance with state laws. However, that memo also discusses at length having a vigorous system of statewide regulation. We're finally going to be having one. All right, Attorney Jessica uh, McElfresh, uh, thanks so much for the update. Thank you. Democrats vying for the presidency are in Vegas tonight for their first televised debate. Five candidates, including Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, are on stage. In the air is whether Clinton can shift the focus from emails she sent over a private server to policies she's proposed. Overshadowing the contest is Vice President Joe Biden, who is flirting with a late entry and could announce a decision within days. Tune in to Morning Edition tomorrow for highlights and analysis as the candidates face off in Vegas for a spot on the Democratic presidential ticket. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. One of the first people to have their genome sequenced is now giving San Diegans a chance to sequence theirs. KPBS science reporter David Wagner explains. J. Craig Venter sequenced his own DNA over a decade ago in the race to map the first human genome. Now his San Diego company, Human Longevity Inc., is offering a new service aiming to help customers do the same. It's called Health Nucleus. And on top of a whole genome sequence, it provides customers with a battery of tests. That includes a full body MRI scan, an ultrasound of the heart, microbiome sequencing. All of this is aiming to give individuals a full picture of their own health. Venter says the few people who've already gone through Health Nucleus have already learned a lot about themselves. The first two people that came through, uh, we found life-saving information for one of them, a physician who didn't know he had certain traits. So uh, uh, it's going to be very valuable to most individuals that come through. Enrollment will not be cheap. Signing up starts at $25,000. But Venter believes that once insurance companies see how much can be saved through disease prevention, they'll also decide to cover it. David Wagner, KPBS News. There are new accusations of price gouging, leaving California drivers paying more at the pump. Oil companies say gas prices are high because of the state's strict environmental regulations. The consumer watchdog says Californians have been paying a dollar more per gallon than other parts of the country. They accuse the oil companies of jacking up the price. The oil refiners used to take home on every gallon of gas about 48 cents, according to the California Energy Commission. In July, the oil refiners took home a buck 60 a gallon. So the money that we're not paying towards crude oil, but we're still paying a pretty significant uh, premium at the pump, is going right into the refiners' pockets. Oil companies say gas is expensive because they are required to produce a special fuel blend to meet state air quality standards. A huge wind farm in Mexico is powering homes in San Diego County. KPBS front terrace reporter Gene Guerrero explains why it's at the center of legal disputes on both sides of the border. 
The small rural Mexican town of Hakume lies in the shadow of the first cross-border wind farm between the U.S. and Mexico. On a recent Sunday, residents played a game of baseball with the turbines spinning in the horizon. The wind farm is called Energia Sierra Juarez. It started operations this summer, operated by Sembra affiliates Ianova and Intergen. 62-year-old Jose Mercado runs a small market near the center of town. He's one of the residents leasing land to the project. We leased the land to the company, right? And the company put the turbines, giving us a percentage of its profits. Mercado says there are 76 owners of the communal land, known as an ejido. Each member of the ejido gets about $2,000 a month from the wind farm. That's huge for a small rural town like Hakume, where the main source of income had been livestock. The land wasn't suitable for plantings or even construction because it's all just rock. The wind farm gives us money to survive without having to work. That's what we want, not to have to work. Members of the ejido meet every two months to discuss their shared land. Mercado says he's glad they approved the wind farm. We benefit, but not as much as the company, naturally. All of the electricity is sold to San Diego Gas and Electric through a cross-border transmission line. The project is part of a statewide scramble for renewable energy. California must get half of its electricity from renewables by the year 2030. Energia Sierra Juarez plans to expand its current 155 megawatt capacity by close to 700 percent, with hundreds of additional turbines on the mountain range. But the plan is being challenged. This is my wild place. My whole life I've been up in these ranges. Aaron Quintanar is a San Diego resident who visits the Sierra Juarez mountain range to hike and enjoy nature. In 2011, he was part of a lawsuit filed in Mexico over the project's environmental impact assessment, which outlined an impact area of more than 5,000 acres. The suit claimed the assessment didn't specify exact locations of turbines, roads, and other infrastructure. What roads do is they create uh, fragmentation. Quintanar says where the roads are built is important because they can disrupt migration patterns for wildlife, such as the endangered bighorn sheep. Same with turbines impacting birds. Slow-moving, heavy-winged birds, they just come in, they don't have the ability to make quick changes or turns in flight, and they just become, they just get taken out by 150-mile-an-hour wingtip. Mexico's environmental agency says the project meets its legal requirements. Plant operator Ianova says it's going above and beyond requirements, with a plant nursery, a bird and bat monitoring program, and more. The lawsuit in Mexico failed, but a battle in U.S. court continues. U.S. environmentalists say the Sierra Juarez mountain range is part of the western spine of North America, one of the most important natural habitats along the continent's coast. Wildlife impacts on one side of the border can have consequences on the other side. Natural resources don't recognize any sort of political boundaries. I would just like to see Californians take more responsibility for resource conservation and management in Mexico, because it is all one landscape. Back in Hakume, Jose Mercado says he's also concerned about possible harm to local wildlife, but he decided it wasn't his priority. That's the way of the Mexican. We see the cash and the present, not the people in front or behind us, like the government, which thinks only of its purse. When you don't have anything, someone offers you something, you know, it's hard to say no. And I, I wouldn't hold that against people. That's Donna Tisdale of Boulevard in the East County. She's behind the ongoing lawsuit in the U.S. Tomorrow, we'll take a closer look at the debate on the U.S. side of the border and how the wind farm marks a changing dynamic between the U.S. and Mexico. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. <laughs> Basic science makes a big impact in San Diego. A new report from the Regional Economic Development Corporation shows research institutions like the Salk or uh, Scripps contribute $4.5 billion to San Diego's economy each year. The report is the first to measure the impact of the nonprofit research organizations here. Civil liberties advocates in California are claiming a victory with what some call the nation's best digital privacy law. 
Peggy Pico explains what you need to know about laws targeting technology and privacy. Governor Jerry Brown signed more than 800 bills into law since the beginning of this year, including several that address privacy issues in personal tech devices like your TV, smartphone, and tablets. Here with an in-depth look into the state's new privacy laws is my guest, Art Neal, Executive Director of California Western School of Law, New Media Rights Program. And Art, one of the new laws regulates police searches of smartphones, tablets, Fitbits, GPS, all these types of devices. So how does the law protect personal information on these types of uh, devices? Well, it really requires that if a government entity, law enforcement, is going to try to get your electronic communications, your electronic data, this is a wide variety of data, right? Emails to location data, uh, that they're going to need a search warrant. And, and that the U.S. Supreme Court already ruled on a, a San Diego case actually involving uh, digital searches. So why was this law needed then? Right. So you're talking about the Riley case, which came down last year in the Supreme Court. And the important issue that was decided there was that California really prior to the Supreme Court's decision, had said, you know what, if we arrest somebody, if a government entity or law enforcement arrests somebody, that the data on their cell phone, it's pretty much free reign in terms of searching that incident to the arrest. Uh, now, the Supreme Court said, look, with regards to cell phones, when you're arrested, uh, there's going to be a higher standard. Unless there's some kind of emergency situation, law enforcement should have to get a warrant. And so with regards to cell phone data, this is kind of, this new law is based basically making Riley the law of the land in California, but also expanding it a little bit beyond cell phones to service providers like Facebook and Google, et cetera, that have your personal information and other kinds of devices like you mentioned that might collect personal information. Of yours. So a warrant would be needed on that. Moving inside the home with so-called smart TVs, uh, how are they different, first of all, from standard TVs? Well, a smart TV can do a variety of things. Uh, the key feature that we're talking about here and the key feature that was uh, in the bill from, that was signed recently has to do with voice recognition technology and so really uh, smart TVs are televisions with computers inside of them really and they can allow us to watch video content but they can also now uh, recognize our voices and take commands from us. And they can also record what you are viewing in your habits, as you were saying. Exactly. So there's uh, there's recording of your voice uh, for the purposes of, of making this voice recognition to uh, technology work. And so what does the new law have to say about smart TVs? So the new law says really two things. Number one, if your TV comes with a voice recognition uh, feature, then the manufacturer of the TV needs to be very clear that that feature is, uh, is there. And if they are recording your conversations in your living room, what you're saying in your living room, then uh, they can't sell that information to third parties. They can't use it for advertising. With uh, uh, It's basically against the law to do that. Now, does that apply to other devices linked to a TV? Let's say Roku, Apple TV, or even like Comcast uh, DVR. So that's the most interesting thing about this law. No, it, it really is very narrowly tailored to deal with smart TVs. And so all these video game consoles, the new Xbox, for instance, has voice features. Uh, and not just devices you connect to your TV, like the, the Google Chromecast or Apple TV, but also it doesn't, the law doesn't even cover applications that you install on the TV. So if you go to a, if you go to a third party that's not the TV manufacturer and install an application like a Netflix or Amazon sure. on your TV, not covered. All right, now uh, moving to the airways, way up in the airways, <laughs> new drone legislation known as the paparazzi bill for slang aims to protect uh, the privacy of all Californians, not just uh, Hollywood movie stars. How does that work? Right. So this really takes what are established physical invasion of privacy laws, physical trespass laws. And it says, you know, in, in days gone by, not only was it a trespass to physically trespass on somebody's property and take personal and private photos and record information, but it was also a violation of privacy to say, uh, you know, go to a third floor of a building and use a high power telephoto lens to take a photo of somebody half a mile away and on their private space. So what this really says is, look, the same thing's going to be illegal if you're using a drone, right? And so it's it really adds the term airspace to our physical trespass laws. And it says if you're flying a drone um, and you're basically collecting sound recordings or video recordings uh, that are of a personal or private nature uh, and, you know, you're doing 
doing that without permission, then you're going to be uh, violating the law. Keep your drones close by. All right, Attorney Art Neal, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. I sit down with Bob Woodward and the source of his new book on President Nixon. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. A push for pink ribbon license plates. The effort comes from the Survivor Sisters. Their goal is to raise breast cancer awareness. So far, 1,000 Californians have pre ordered the plates, but the DMV needs nearly 8,000 orders to begin producing them. And we're hoping that the plate will get women, they'll see it and say, hey, I, you know, I haven't had my mammogram, or I haven't gone for a checkup in a really long time. I need to go have a check. And this is a great way that people will see it every day on the roads. Money raised from the plates will help women get free clinical breast exams and mammograms. If you're interested in the pink ribbon license plate, you can go to pinkplate.org. Here's a look at what we are working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Midday Edition, how the food we eat affects the health of the planet was almost a consideration in the new U.S. dietary guidelines. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. Of course, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.